Hi, uh, my name is Konstantinos. Uh, I've been working in quantum since 2012. Um, I started in post-quantum cryptography, uh, working on QKD and, and some other areas. Uh, I moved into working with quantum computers too, and, and in my role, I help companies work with quantum computers to solve problems and also um, help companies with post-quantum cryptography. I'm also the host of the Post-Quantum World. If you want to uh, take a listen to that, we cover a lot of the topics uh, that you'll hear about today. Uh, next slide. So we talked a lot about the threat to cryptography, and um, I just wanted to start by highlighting what this threat really is. So cryptography, modern cryptography, is based on very, very hard math of some type, right? So there is symmetric cryptography. You could think of it as data tossed into a lockbox, and you turn a key, and you put it away. Uh, symmetric cryptography is basically protected by the difficulty of searching through a great large key space. You know, um, So if you think of something like AES-256, it's a whole lot of possible keys to search through to try and unlock. And if you do any kind of search against those keys, you'll find that on average, it'll take you about half the number. So let's say, to give you a small example, let's say there were 100 passwords to try. Um, if you were to search them randomly, it would take you about 50 tries to guess what they are. Well, there is an algorithm that quantum computers can do called Grover's algorithm that greatly reduces that search time to square root of n. So um, 100, in the case of 100 passwords, let's say, to try, you would have to only try 10. That simplifies it. And as you can imagine, as the numbers get really large, that square root advantage becomes even more powerful. So for all intents and purposes, a quantum computer could turn something like AES-128 into something like AES-64, and you would never run that in your organization. So that's, um, that's one type of cryptography is at its risk. So it's not cracked, it's just a speed up. Now, when it comes to asymmetric encryption, uh, when you think of RSA, um, this is based on the difficult math of factoring large numbers, or what we call the discrete log problem. Uh, quantum computers using Shor's algorithm can actually just crack that. It's not a weakening, it just flat out cracks it. So it's able to discover, let's say, the two really large numbers that were multiplied to make a really, really, really large number. Classical computers struggle with this. Quantum computers will be good with this. Um, one of the estimates is 2 1 plus 2 logical qubits. So to crack something like uh, RSA uh, 2048, you would need 4,098 logical qubits in perfect ideal conditions. That's just one approach that's uh, speculated to work. Um, so we're, we're nowhere near there yet. But as it turns out, um, we don't have to worry about when quantum computers are powerful enough to crack encryption, because particularly here in the USA, uh, now that NIST has released their standards, um, last November, they also released a timeline for deprecation and disallow. So that means by 2030, RSA, ECC, some other things will be deprecated and by 2035 disallowed. So when people ask me when the quantum apocalypse is, it's really 2035 because you will not be using any of these algorithms past 2035, period. So that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, next slide. So I say that NIST uh, released some standards for post-quantum cryptography. There are different types of math that quantum computers are not very good at uh, reversing. Um, I can't, I don't have time to go into all these, but I just wanted to show you that there's a few. Um, the one you see there, code-based cryptography, that will actually be the next um, cipher up to be um, standardized. Uh, it's called HQC. And if you've ever worked with error correcting code in the past, you, you might have an idea of how this works. You, you literally send out the garbled message and the error correcting code cleans it up to hopelessly simplify that. The one we'll be focusing on today mostly is lattice-based cryptography. Uh, next slide. So the standards included lattice-based cryptography, which is why we're going to be focusing on it today. So MLChem is, it used to be called Crystal's Kyber, a nice nerdy name, uh, in keeping with the nerd theme. MLChem does um, key encapsulation. It basically, it does that handshake where you share private key data to establish a symmetric cipher key going forward. So um, that will replace RSA directly. MLDSA is a lattice-based uh, signature standard. We're not going to talk about signatures at all today because we don't have time. But I do want to zero in on how lattices work. So most people here probably know that RSA works on factoring numbers, like I mentioned earlier. You could probably go to a cocktail party and, and you know, tell people how that works in, in, at really high level. So I just want you to walk away from this talk with the ability to have the cocktail party level of understanding of what we're replacing that with. We need another way to generate really hard to reverse numbers, right? So that's where lattices come in. Next slide. So when you think of a lattice, it's, it's basically just dots in a field, right? 
And um, they're not random, though. They look random, but they're not. They have a repeating pattern that's created in a very specific way. So if I ask you to, Im to imagine two-dimensional lattice, it's easy. It's just dots like you see. A three-dimensional lattice, you could probably think of um, little marbles floating in a glass box, right? Floating in space, that's a three-dimensional lattice. Um, but next slide. What happens if you try to imagine four dimensions? <laughs> Anyone who's seen the movie Interstellar has seen this um, attempted uh, uh, explanation of what four dimensions or high-dimensional space might look like, a tesseract. Um, but luckily, computers don't need to visualize. Computers just need to work with math. So when we're talking about lattices, it's really just stacking more numbers in a matrix describing the lattice. So computers have no problems working with an infinite number of dimensions, assuming you have the time to do all the computation. But we're going to keep things simple. So next slide. So we're going to go back to two dimensions. And now I just want to give you all a sense of how we get these two dimensions. Um, how do we get them to, um, to show up? And, and the thing fixed on my Mac so I can take over the slides now. <laughs> so if you think back to like high school um, class in math, uh, you, would, you would see this uh, grid, right? X and Y um, axis grid. And we're gonna zoom into the upper right corner to keep things simple, the, the positive corner, where X is positive and Y is positive. So to create a lattice, all we really need to do is to figure out what our basis vectors are, okay? So basis vectors um, determine what pattern repeats to create the lattice. So here you see we have two comma one and we have one comma three. So you just count over and up, over and up. But it turns out that there is a way to have bad basis vectors as well. So we need to know these good basis vectors if we're going to describe a lattice correctly. See, for example, if we use these basis vectors and we have them repeat, we will end up with the same exact um, lattice, but it will be an incorrect lattice. Because if I were to try and do any kind of math, if I were to try and get to a specific point, it would create an error. So you'll understand with the next slide what I mean. So if we go back to the correct basis vectors, you can multiply these and end up at a specific point, right? So if I say you're going to do two and then one over, you see, we like move up and move one over and we can end up at a point we all agree on because we've described the matrix um, that describes the lattice correctly. If we did it incorrectly, the same operation would have us at a point way off in space in the distance that's just not correct. So we need to know what we're talking about here. So that's one of the secret numbers, if you will, the way that we describe the lattice, the matrix that describes the lattice. Now, um, there's, a, there's a problem that classical computers and quantum computers have a hard time solving, and that's called the closest vector problem. If I were to ask you to find by, if I put a random dot on this and I were to ask you to find the closest vector, the closest valid point in this lattice, it's a really, really difficult problem for a computer to do. And it gets even harder with higher dimensions. So keep that in mind. So I didn't want to make things too complicated, but we're not doing two comma one, three comma two, whatever. We're not doing that kind of math here. We're actually stacking polynomials when we deal with ML chem and post-quantum cryptography. So it looks more like the ugliness you see at the top, but don't panic, that's just for illustration purposes. I just want you to know that that is very complicated. Now, if I were to pick a secret vector to multiply by and to end up at the point you see in purple on here, that gets us closer to what the RSA magic is of two numbers multiplied that give you a really big one, right? So we've got the complex matrix, we've got something secret we're multiplying, and we end up somewhere. However, unfortunately, it turns out that that's still a reversible math problem. You can still um, do a matrix inverse and Gaussian elimination and end up revealing what that secret is. So we're not quite there yet. We need to add something else to make this difficult for quantum computers to reverse. And that something else is learning with errors. And what that means is we add a small amount of error coefficient to that multiplication. And then we publish certain aspects of this, and that makes it difficult to reverse. So that small amount of error moves the dot up to that, error, to that area that you see there marked in yellow. And as a result of doing that, it's impossible to reverse just by having the numbers to do the math, but using certain equations involved in the encoding of the um, message, which we don't have time to go into, just trust me, there are certain ways to then remove the error after and get back the information that you need if you're the secret key holder. So what we publish then is A, the matrix, 
and T, the vector, that answer where we end up. And that becomes the public key. And people can use that to encode a message. S, that, that vector, is the private key. And E is an error vector with small coefficients that is not published. So because of this combination of numbers, we have the replacement for just the factoring that lets us do a type of math that can't be reversed, back to that initial point. Cryptography is basically hard math that can't be reversed, and that's what's protecting your data. So this is the, the basics of um, lattice uh, cryptography. So it turns out that ML Chem is more than just post-quantum safe. It's actually something that we should be migrating to for performance aspects too. Um, if you compare um, ML Chem to RSA, it turns out that even though the public key and ciphertext are larger um, and puts like a little bit of a strain on resources, machines are getting better all the time. Uh, encapsulation, RSA is still about twice as fast at encapsulating a message, but decapsulation gets crazy. It's something like 90 times faster to decapsulate a message using ML Chem. And when it comes to generating keys, this is where the math gets really crazy. If you imagine the world's fastest fighter jet and you multiply its speed by three times, that would be RSA generating keys. The speed of light would be ML Chem generating keys. So it is orders of magnitude faster when it comes to key generation. So ultimately our networks will not suffer from this. Um, there are certain considerations that take into account. Some people are trying hybrid approaches when migrating. And um, you get into certain troubles with MTU sizes and things like that. I don't really have time to go into that, but maybe in the Q&A. But ultimately, once we move to pure ML Chem, um, the highest level with four dimensions uh, represented like earlier, it should be um, decent performance and probably overall, because it's two out of the three better performance moving forward with networks. And before I finish, I wanted to point out a couple of things. Um, I, I mentioned the deprecation and disallow of what's coming. So we have the first finalists, MLCAM, MLDSA, SLH, DSA. And these are obviously going to be allowed as we move forward. And we have um, HQC that's going to be draft next year and a final standard uh, the year after. So these will all be allowed going forward. But NIST makes a recommendation that I wholeheartedly disagree with. So I have to like mention this in public as often as possible <laughs> to see if I can get them to change their mind on this. They recommend that it's okay to have a 128 bits of security strength for symmetric cryptography. Um, you notice I didn't mention any kind of post-quantum symmetric cryptography, a post-quantum replacement for AES. That's because it's that Grover search problem, right? All it does is, is reduce the time it takes to search. So I can't recommend AES-128 because, as I mentioned earlier, that would reduce to something we don't use, so an AES-64 with a successful Grover attack. You don't want 64 resulting bits of security strength in the days of um, quantum computing when it, when it reaches a certain level of power. So I would strongly recommend going higher, um, AES-256 if possible, because even against a successful Grover's attack, you'll still end up with AS-128, which should, for all intents and purposes, mean you're protected going forward. So basically, you could consider this kind of chart, but, but also consider that, that, um, that it's important to have that amount of relative strength. And as I mentioned earlier, quantum computers, when they arrive, we don't know. There's all sorts of estimates. Uh, I might be talking about that uh, a bit more precisely this summer at, at DEF CON Quantum Village because um, I, I have some research to share there. But, um, but for now, as I mentioned, we know the date that we're not going to be allowed to use um, anything but post-quantum strong cryptography, and that's 2035. Thanks.